Um, hello, my name is Kelly Dender, and I am a student oral historian at Monmouth University. Today is December 3rd, 2021. We're here today with retired Colonel Mike Ruane. Um, they have agreed to be interviewed for the Monmouth County 9-11 and its Aftermath Oral History Project, which is ongoing to collect valuable stories for the historic record. Okay. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your early life and, you know, where you are born and raised? Oh, okay. Uh my name's Mike Ruane. Uh, I was initially, I was born in the Bronx, New York, and shortly afterwards my family moved to uh, Jersey City, New Jersey. And I was raised in Jersey City. I went to school there. I uh, went to grammar school there. I went to high school there. And I went to college at Seton Hall University, and I graduated from there in 1963. Uh, my major was <laughs> my major was accounting, and I've only done uh, <laughs> three months of accounting work in my life. And uh, you could actually say my major over there was uh, uh, the military because I always wanted to be in the military. So I was in the military for five years, uh, from 63 to 68. Uh, served in Vietnam, uh, was an infantry officer. <coughs> Excuse me. And when I got back from Vietnam, I uh, ended up working at Chase Manhattan Bank for about five years. Yeah. Uh, ended up back in Jersey in another banking job. And then in, uh, I guess, about 1976, I got a position at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. And the reason was I was living in Belford at the time. And Were Fort you really? Huh? Were you really? Yeah. That's where I'm from. Really? Belford, yeah. What part? Um, the wet side. Okay. Yeah. 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 So. I was just on a dry side, right over Campbell's Junction. Right over Campbell's Junction. I live Junction. on the op opposite side, right yeah. over the highway. Yeah. <laughs> well, we... Uh, we moved there, I, I guess, when I got back from uh, uh, from Vietnam, actually. Then okay. I was assigned for one year down at Fort Monmouth as a military officer. And like I said, then I joined banking. I was in banking up until 76. And then uh, in 76, I, was, I joined uh, Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. And the main reason was in banking, especially when I was working in New York, I'm traveling six hours a day or five hours a day. And, you know, for a seven-hour job, and I wasn't seeing my family, whereby if I worked at yeah. Fort Monmouth, I'm only 15 minutes away, so it was a lot better for the family. Right, it makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> so I started off Fort Monmouth in personnel, which was my background in banking, believe it or not, mm -hmm. and uh, eventually ended up in plans and operations, uh, which was uh, what I really loved. And I was in plans and operations for the remainder of my career there, which Let's see, I was 25 years at Fort Monmouth, so I had to be 20 years, 20 years in plans and operations. Uh, starting off with the, uh, I guess it was the, the plans analysis and evaluation, I forget what they call it right now, but I eventually ended up as being the director of plans training and mobilization for the U.S. Army Garrison. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So that's uh, where the story actually begins, <coughs> because... My job there was to run exercises, <coughs> counterterrorism and emergency management exercises. Mm -hmm. And it was, to, okay, how can the fort react, you know, to various scenarios? It could be a hurricane, it could be, it could be a sniper, it could be, uh, uh, you know, fires, flood, whatever else right. it was. So we used to run series, series of exercises during the years. And uh, there was one, we started uh, a series that we called Timely Alert timely alert exercises and we started them right after the uh, the World Trade Center bombing of 93 and I guess it was in the uh, in 2000 I retired uh, December 2000 however before that my wife and I uh, formed up a company uh, because I couldn't I could see myself retiring but I couldn't see myself sitting back in my butt <laughs> and, I need something to do yeah. <laughs> and so we we started up a company based upon based upon my background and uh, it was called the James Thomas Group. It was uh, Counterterrorism and Emergency Management Consulting. And uh, so we had the company. I'm trying to figure out the, this, the way this went. And George Mudd, who was the garrison commander at the time, uh, mm -hmm. he called me in February of uh, 2001 and said, Hey, Mike, I know, you, I know you're doing counterterrorism stuff, but uh, we need someone to run... Uh, uh, Fort Monmouth celebration over here. I said, okay, fine. <laughs> you, you want an Irishman to run a celebration? Sure. <laughs> you got yeah. it. So, so I ended up, ended up running, running a, uh, uh, it was like a community, community event, three day community event based on the, uh, I guess it was the, 
at the time it had to be Flag Day and the Army's birthday. But so anyway, that that went off very well. And I was, again, packing up my bags to go home, if you want to call it. And then uh, I got a call from the, the garrison commander again. And he said, uh, listen, we're running, we're trying to run an exercise, uh, counterterrorism exercise, based on your Time Alert series. And uh, the guy who's doing it is, is, is a little bit lost. We'd mm -hmm. like you to come in and do it. So I guess that was about July, uh, July 2001. So... I came in, sat down with the people I was going to be working with, and we developed a plan for the exercise. And, we, and it started off to be a uh, a multi-phase, multi-level exercise. By multi-phase, I'm talking about those like the pre-exercise phase was the exercise itself, and then it was the after, the after phase, the aftermath. And by multi-level, we're talking about it was not only uh, the garrison of Fort Monmouth, it was also the the Communications Electronics Command of Fort Monmouth was outside agencies. The county was involved in it. State police were involved in it and everything else. And the first phase was the intelligence building phase. And what I had, I had, <coughs> from working at the fort over the years, I knew an awful lot of people uh, in, in this, you know, law enforcement, emergency management community. Mm -hmm. And also had a lot of friends. So what I did, I, I developed little pieces of intelligence. Uh, for example, you know, three... Uh, three Middle, Middle Eastern looking men were, were at this deli asking questions about Fort Monmouth Gate. Uh, then it'd be something else, say, you know, a truck was stolen at such and such a place. Right. And, and some of the, uh, some of the pieces of intelligence were, were red herrings. They were just false. But I mean, it was just all this information. And it was, I had the people calling into Fort Monmouth or calling into the local police stations who then would call into Fort Monmouth. Okay. So it's coming in from all over to try and develop this. Okay, what's going on? It looks like something's going to be happening here. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was going on from I guess July all the way up until the uh, uh, the beginning of beginning of September. Matter of fact, all the way up to the uh, I guess it had to be the week the week before the week before the nine eleven event. And we ended up uh, asking for volunteers. Uh, because the scenario we set up was built on uh, a disciple of Osama bin Laden setting off a chemical release in the Post Theater during, a, during an event okay. that, 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 the, that the Post was having. Mm -hmm. So we had 75 volunteers. Uh, we met at 8 o'clock in the morning on 9-11. Brief them as to what their job was. You know, okay, you're going to be seated around here. What's going to happen is... You know, this supposed uh, chemical release is going to be there. You guys are going to fall in your chairs and we're going to be videotaping this, okay, because we're going to be using that as part of an overall training package that we're developing. Mm -hmm. So uh, the event takes place, supposedly, about 8.15. Uh, all of a sudden, the calls went out to, to you know, the, the standard operating procedure. How are you going to get people in there? So... We actually had the Fort Monmouth Fire Department and the Provost Marshals were the first one in there. Next thing you know, we had the Sheriff's Office coming in. Then we had the County Office on, of Emergency Management. Then we had various other agencies coming in or calling in at that time. And uh, we had just done our first rehearsal about 8.30. We finished our first rehearsal. And you know, we're talking to people and so forth. And I'm in, I'm in the Post Theater because I was the exercise director, so I'm, I'm the puppet master, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking to the people, talking to the videographers, and uh, all of a sudden, John Erickson, who was the, uh, the fire chief at that time, he comes in and tells me, hey, Mike, we just got, just got something over radio that a plane crashed into the World Trade Center. Oh, my God. And, and I said, what are you talking about, John? He said, no, a plane just crashed into the World Trade Center. I told everybody, okay, everybody, just take a break in place right now. Let me, I have to find out something. I'll be right back in. Mm -hmm. So we went outside, and while we're out there, the second plane went in. Then we realized that this is, uh, this is what's going to be. Because the first plane went in, we didn't know the size of the plane or anything else like right. that. Because planes have crashed into buildings before. We thought it was a small plane. Right, so you think it's an accident. Yeah. And... Uh, when the second plane went in, we knew it wasn't an accident. Definitely knew it wasn't an accident. Yeah. And uh, I went back into the theater, told everybody what had happened. And people actually thought it was part of the exercise. We oh, said, no, God. this is real. This is real. You know, go back to your, go back to your, uh, your work areas and uh, wait for direction from your supervisors, mm -hmm. what they're going to tell you to do. 
uh, on our part, my part and the garrison, you know, the provost marshal and, and the fire department. Uh, fire department went back uh, to, you know, to their to the firehouse. Provost marshal all of a sudden started up in security at the gates because uh, we didn't know. You don't know what's going to happen. Is this one right. piece? And all of a sudden we're finding out different things are happening. Uh, I went back to the garrison uh, commander and uh, the guy I was working for, the director of plans, training, mobilization, was taking my place, a guy by the name of Ed Devlin. Uh, I told Ed uh, that we, uh, we were going to set up an operations center. We didn't have an operations center at the garrison. I told him, I'll set up the operations center. He stayed with the old man, mm -hmm. the garrison commander at this time. It wasn't George Mudd, it, was, it was another guy, Army Lieutenant Colonel. And uh, we set up, started setting up an operations center so that we could control what's going on at Fort Monmouth anyway and part of the surrounding areas because we literally closed off Ocean Port Avenue. So now you couldn't get, you couldn't get from uh, Ocean Port to Little Silver unless you went all the way around on Route 35 or uh, that right. was the only way you could do it. Otherwise, you had to go all the way out to the ocean and come back in to do it. Right. Because Ocean Port Avenue was the only was the only through through area. Uh, we set up the operations center, and I think, uh, as my wife said, she didn't see me for two months in daylight. Wow! I mean, it was def basically uh, we're working. Uh, well, the operations center is working twenty four hours a day, but I was basically there eighteen hours a day. Go home, get a couple hours of sleep, and come back in again. Uh, the, inter the, the, the real interesting part about this was uh, working for the government is, is very, there's very levels uh, of, uh, of what you can and what you can't do. Mm -hmm. The first one is, you know, someone who works for the Department of the Army. Okay, then they have the contractors underneath there. Then they have the subcontractors. Well, I was a subcontractor. And it eventually dawned on someone in February 2002 that, hey, Mike Ruane is not a Department of the Army civilian, <laughs> and, he's, and, and he's not active duty military. Huh. Yeah. yeah. But I was, I was running the operations center, so I was literally commanding uh, regular Army, uh, reserves, reservists, Department of the Army civilians, contractors, and subcontractors. I was, wow. I was, I was literally just, just running the operations right, center. Right, right. And we ended up... Uh, I guess after the first day, it was the 11th, I think it was the 12th or the 13th, uh, I reached out to the local uh, police departments, the ones right around the fort. Mm -hmm. uh, Eatontown, let me just, because I did take some notes on this <laughs> thing here. It was uh, Eatontown, uh, Little Silver, Tinton Falls, and uh, Oceanport. Okay. And we got them in and we started talking about, okay, how we're going to be able to secure the area around here. And... Uh, one of the things that I talked to them about was the fact that they knew they knew their areas much better than we did. Mm -hmm. We knew the fort, they knew their areas. And we needed them to be a part of our intelligence network or if you see something, say something. I mean, right, I mean right. I, that was one of the things. And uh, if, if stuff was happening in their neighborhoods or people uh, observing what was going on at Fort Monmouth, and it was a lot of that. Part of it was curiosity. Part of it we learned afterwards was uh, uh, a cell uh, oh, wow. that this was the same cell that, that went down and hit Fort Dix or tried to get to Fort Dix. Wow. They, they couldn't get into Fort Monmouth, but, mm -hmm. but they tried to get, they did get into Fort Dix. Well, so we had them, we had them uh, as our partners in this. Mm -hmm. And we called it the uh, Community Force Protection Council. And it, it started off with, you know, the four agencies or the four, the four towns, uh, we had we had Fort Monmouth uh, police and fire, uh, the operations center. Uh, we had the uh, Red Bank FBI; they were part of it too. And this thing expanded to become the Community Force Protection Council. That uh, by the time we closed it out, I guess it was over a year later, uh, we had close to forty different agencies involved in it, including CSX yes. Railroad. Okay, because okay. The, the rail lines were here. We had them just, and again, I put it down to Monmouth County Sheriff's Office. We had the uh, uh, state police, mm -hmm. uh, National Guard, uh, FBI, the railroad, National Guard, Monmouth County Sheriff's, Monmouth County OEM. And 
we'd meet once a month and we pass on information. Mm-hmm. And and it was it was a great opportunity for everyone to get together and, and know what everyone else was doing. And and it and it worked very well. And it worked very well. But the uh, uh, the nine eleven uh, going back to to nine eleven. Uh, Fort Monmouth supported that in many ways. Uh, our fire department ended up in, in the Atlantic Highlands. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, when people were coming in from the ferries, they were decontaminating right. them. Okay, okay hosing they were hosing them down. everybody yeah. down. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we had our uh, the communications electronics command. Uh, they had special equipment that could actually see through the earth. Okay, so they were using that up there. Uh, mm-hmm. There was like three different things we had. It was stuff that we could give to the local community that they could use, mm-hmm. okay, because it wasn't classified. Right. Then it was stuff that was classified, and that was just, that was the things. Hey, we we can't give it to you. Mm-hmm. And but that was two different things basically. And and the other part was just we had people up there helping them on the ground. Uh, one of the, uh, I guess, and that went on. That went on for weeks, while they were, while they were working on the pile. Mm-hmm. You know, it was. It was it was terrible for the guys that I knew who were there on it. They, they said it's something they're never going to forget. Hmm. The uh, another interesting thing: my wife was a teacher in Long Branch. Okay. Okay. So she's she's down in a classroom, and one of the uh, one one of the other teachers came in and said, "Barbara, I don't know if you heard, but there's you know a plane crashed in a World Trade Center." Hmm. And my wife wasn't even thinking about. it. She says, "Oh, that's part of the exercise in running for it, Mama." <laughs> And it, 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 no, it didn't. No, but they're running an exercise. And the teacher said, Barbara, unless your husband, you know, grab their face, and unless your husband oh can goodness. get a plane to run into it. And all of a sudden, it was, it was reality to everybody. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was pretty much, pretty much what happened. I mean, uh, there was uh, stuff that was going around. It was very suspicious. I, I mean, you know, the, uh, uh, the doubters, if you want to call it, are the mm. ones you have to find out, you know, question everything. They're saying it's very suspicious that there was, I think there's three or four exercises being run by the military uh, that exact day. Mm-hmm. And we were one of them. And, you know, is this a coincidence, they were asking? Right. Yeah, it was a coincidence. You know, we, we just happened to pick a date, and that was the date. Right, we yeah, picked that date months that. before. Yeah, yeah, of course. And the only people who really knew to, what the date was was about, up until about a week beforehand, was probably about three or four of us. Because we didn't want anybody, uh, you know, we call it G two and but it but it's you know, checking out and seeing how they can look good, you know, mm-hmm. when the exercise happens. Right, you so have to do what, it like it would be as natural as possible. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So Fort Monmouth actually sent people up to the um, World Trade Center, Ground Zero, to yeah. help them. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And they were there for a while. They were there for a while. We had, uh, and uh, and like I said, our equipment. Uh, our equipment was up there all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, our fire department was involved. You know, the fort was involved. You know, we were involved with other people, but we were all over the place right. you know, for the next few months. Mm. That's, that's crazy. Yeah. So now you were a subcontractor at the time. You weren't enlisted. No, I was okay. a subcontractor. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think that's, that's, that's crazy. Um, all right. Um, what was like, was there any, any intelligence or suspicion that something was no. supposed to happen we that day? We had nothing at all. Nothing? No. So it was complete surprise? Yes. Even to the military? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It was, you know, the only intelligence was the exercise intelligence that we had set up, but right. every, everything was, uh, Everything was, you know, DEFCON, DEFCON 1. There wasn't any, any, any reason to, uh, to step up anything. Mm-hmm. I mean, the intelligence, there wasn't any about anything going to happen. Right, so no one even knew that the planes were hijacked no. until after the no. fact. No, until, until they went into the buildings. Wow, that's crazy. So, um, what, what was your personal reaction to all of it? When I first heard it happen, um, it, 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 it's almost, it was almost like, uh, let me put it this way, when, when, when I was in combat, uh, okay, the rounds would go off, 
you know, all of a sudden you, you, you get in the middle of a battle, everything, mm -hmm. everything goes on train. Mm -hmm. You don't have a chance to think about anything until afterwards. Right. It was the same thing then. It was, uh, when it happened, I, I did one of these old shits, and I, and I ended up, okay, guys, here's what we got to do. Right after that, then it was, okay, now here's what we have to do. Then right. afterwards, when I had a chance to start looking at the television sets and seeing what was going on, then, then the reaction came in, and it was anger. Yeah, anger. It was anger. It was anger. It was, you know, I, I remember a bunch of us up there crying just, just watching, just watching the people jump. Yeah. Just watching people jump out of buildings. How desperate do you have to be that you jump in a hundred stories? Yeah. Yeah. It was horrific. Yeah. It was horrific. Um, so now, as a, you know, a former member of the military, yeah. did you have any, you know, inclination that what happened after, like, did you suspect that we were going to go to war overseas? Did you suspect it would be for 20 years? No, I didn't expect it <laughs> to be 20 years, but, but I... Uh, I expected we were going to do something, I, I, because you know you're not going to let something like that get away. And we knew we knew where they were and everything else like that. Right. And uh, it was uh, from people I knew, from people I knew in the military, they were telling me that you know it was almost like immediately after this happened, mm -hmm. uh, they were automatically uh, getting ready to deploy. Some of them. Wow. Okay, because. And they didn't have any. They didn't have any orders yet to deploy, but they knew something like this happened. Something they were going to be. They were going to go someplace. And if right. they weren't, then all then they just stood, stood down. But they were going to be ready if they were called. They were ready to go. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, so now, um, were anybody who like a subcontractor like yourself were they recalled into active duty after this? No. Okay. No, they they did call up reserves. Okay. They did call up reserves. But I was, you know, at that time, what the hell was I? I was, I guess, 53, 54. I was only about, no, wait a second. <laughs> no, no, I was, I was, I was, when I retired in 2000, I retired, I got to figure this out right now. <laughs> I was, uh, in 2000, I was 60 or 58 years old. They weren't going to recall me. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, but they were recalling, they were recalling reservists. Mm -hmm. And, uh, what happened was we at Fort Monmouth, we got, uh, as we're locking the post down, they were calling up reserve units, uh, from Massachusetts, actually, oh. uh, that came in a couple of rifle companies and they provided security, uh, for like for the next six months it was. Okay. Yeah. So they were, they were, so they were here to yeah. Yeah. provide security to yeah. Fort Monmouth. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cause at that time we, we really didn't have any military or well, well, we had maybe a couple hundred military on the post and they were, they were primarily logisticians and officers, uh, right. senior level officers. Yeah. It yeah. wasn't like as active as it had been 20 years no, prior to no, that. No, not at all. Um, how did life change after the events of 9-11? <laughs> on the fort? On the fort and, and in your own recollection. Uh, well, the fort, the fort was locked down for years. I mean, I mean uh, wow. yeah. up, up until, you know, it was literally locked down for years. Almost all the time you close the fort, you better just come in. Okay. So, um, what, well, what was life like at, at the fort after that in, in your own life? Well, the fort was in lockdown. Right. Okay, so... And, and for several months, you know, to go into any building, you had to show your identification card. That not only the outside, you know, getting onto the fort, but then to get into buildings, there was additional, additional security checks and mm -hmm. everybody. You know, you don't belong here? Sorry, you're not going to stay here. Wow. Uh, so that tightened that up a little bit. And uh, like everything else, people learn to live with it. Simply mm -hmm. because you're on a military installation, stuff like that happened every once in a while. Anyway. Right, so this, yeah. this is just, this is just full time now. Uh, on the outside, I think it affected the people, especially in Monmouth County, probably more more than many others, simply because of all the people that died in Middletown, right. and, and as many people from Monmouth County that worked at the World Trade Center. Uh, the uh, if you went down to the ocean, you could see it burning. I mean, I mean you could see the smoke. I remember you know. it. Yeah, yeah, like it was yesterday. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so you could see the smoke there. Mm -hmm. uh, personally, for 
my family, my brother worked in Seven World Trade Center. Oh, wow. He was not there that day. He was he was flying in, as a matter of fact. Oh, my goodness. And, and you know, the, the flight was canceled. He was stuck in Houston for a few days. Uh, I had another, uh, my cousin's daughter. Uh, she got through there. She was working right down there. And she came out, we got pictures of her with all the, the soot all over. She lost her shoes, you know. Uh, she was she was traumatized by it. Yeah. She was traumatized by it. Understandably so. Yeah. And, yeah. and she ended up she ended up uh, you know, seeing someone for a period of time to work her way through it. Mm -hmm. But she's fine now, but I mean it was it was it was terrible for her at that time. Yeah. Uh, for me, uh, and my little company, uh, all of a sudden, I was working uh, rather than just, hey, can you do this for us? Can you do this for us? They brought us on full time. Mm. And we, and we uh, the James Thomas Group uh, uh, was a subcontractor for the fort until the fort closed. Oh, okay. And conducting, conducting exercises, doing counterterrorism, as well as doing, you know, community, community events, mm -hmm. the parties. You know, yeah, right, of that. course. <laughs> uh, f again, uh, we started getting, we, my wife and I, she was still teaching at the time. In, I think it was 2002, 2003, uh, she was uh, selected as Teacher of the Year for the Long Branch School mm. System. And two weeks later, she gave in a resignation because we needed her to work for the company. <laughs> and uh, she ended up, she actually ended up uh, going to Fort, uh, I think it was Fort McClellan, down Alabama mm -hmm. uh, with the... Uh, I guess she ended up being a weapons of mass destruction instructor. Wow. She went down there for several weeks of training and, and she ended up coming back as a WMD instructor mm -hmm. and as well as train the trainer. And uh, we did exercises for, for the county for, uh, we were involved in exercises for the state with Port Authority, uh, all the local communities. Mm -hmm. And, and that went on, that went on for the better part of, uh, the better part is about seven or eight years, because initially, initially, oh, we got to do something right now. So what they're doing is pushing money down down to the community to buy equipment, do exercises, train, mm -hmm. train, train, and then you know as time goes on, you know everything. Okay, well nothing's happening. Yeah, it levels and, and off. It levels off again, mm -hmm. and, and until the next event, right? You know, type thing. So that was primarily what happened. And, uh, so 2011, the fort closed. Uh, we kept the company active for another couple of years after that, and then uh, we closed out the company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm officially retired. Officially. <laughs> well, no, because then I ended up here. Now, well, 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 that, well now that, that's part of it. But uh, I guess after the fort closed, uh, the county had a position open for the executive director for the Office on Aging Disabilities and Veterans Services. <laughs> And they asked me if I wanted to do it because mm. I was old. I was, I was, I was old, disabled Aww. veteran. Yeah, I mean, I mean I, that, that's what I use as a talking point anyway. But I stayed with them for about three and a half years. Okay. Yeah, and, and then I officially retired. <laughs> yeah. Um, so did you notice after um, the events of September 11th um, any kind of anti-Islamic behaviors, phobia, phobias, things like that from the community, people around you? Not, not overt. Um, I mean, you know, there, there might have been some going on covertly, but I, I, I didn't really notice that. I, I mean, you're taking a second look mm -hmm. is what it boiled down to. You know, right. you see somebody take a look, saw white vans. You know, you started worrying about white vans. Mm -hmm. You know, because that was one of the one of the things that the, that they use, especially after the '93 event. Right. Uh, but no, because we had. Uh, I mean, we, we had a lot of people from the Mideast to work here on the fort, mm -hmm. you know. So, I mean, I mean, you, you knew these people. Right. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't see it happen much here. I mean, I know that they, were, they were beating up people in, in New York City and various other things like that. Yeah. Uh, which was wrong. But, which is really wrong. Yeah. But I, I, didn't, I didn't really notice it in this area. Okay. And, and I don't think I was totally blind to it, but, but I may not have wanted to notice it. Right. But, Right, because your attitudes change after yeah. something like yeah. that. Um, do you feel like the community that surrounded Fort Monmouth came together following the oh, events? Yeah. Oh, unbelievably. Yeah. Like civilians and enlisted yes. alike? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, uh, 
just just the cooperation we have with the local the local towns, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, like I said, with the Forest Protection Council, and uh, I know that when we ran events here, they were they they were involved all over the place, you know. They, like when we we did the uh, uh, community celebrations, uh, they'd volunteer to bring equipment in and everything else mm -hmm. like that, okay. and, and become part of it. Yeah. So there was much more um, sense of community yes. afterwards. Yes. Okay. Um, what well, are... well, you, well, you can uh, you can look at all the American flags. I, I oh mean, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, you know, they expected that we were going to fall apart. I mean, you know, the uh, the terrorists expected mm -hmm. we we're going to fall apart, and you know, whatever it's going to. And all of a sudden, the next thing you know, there's just American flags flying every place. Right. So you we know? came together yeah. instead. Yeah. Um, what about the county of Monmouth as a whole? Like, um, did you see the same thing? Yes. It just reverberated throughout yeah. this area. Yeah. And and the county, uh, the county office of emergency management, especially, were on top of everything. They they uh, they did some outstanding work. They did some outstanding work after, after that, you know, running exercises to make certain people knew what was going on and how to do it. But again, the same thing, the, the communities were working together. The communities were working right. together. So, um, Do you think that your, um, you know, career as um, an enlisted member of the military had prepared you more for an event like this? Rather, if you hadn't been in the well, military? Yeah. yeah. And... Uh, well, the military, the military gave me the training to be able to see what happens, take a look at it, you know, not overreact, mm -hmm. but, but start making start making decisions based upon the facts and what you see. And uh, like I told you, you know, when it happened, it was all a matter of training. And, and then, then the adrenaline, you know, you're working on the adrenaline. When the adrenaline starts wearing off, then all of a sudden, you, then you, then you uh, uh, realize exactly what was going on. Right. Because I, 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 and I remember that from combat. In combat, it was like, uh, you know, it's the same thing. Adrenaline, so everything, all your training starts taking effect. And the people you're working with, all my men, mm -hmm. uh, they knew what they had to do. And, and everybody was part of a team, so I worked it. And then afterwards, you know, I, I just remember sometimes, especially towards the end of my tour, when the adrenaline was off, all of a sudden, I, I just start shaking a little bit. You know, my hands would start shaking. And, yeah. and, and that'll be that'll be it. So, uh, my training my training definitely definitely helped me on it because I didn't get overwhelmed or overexcited on it. I, mm -hmm. I realized something was going on and someone someone had to take charge, and so I ended up taking charge of setting up the operations center. You know, getting not only with the exercise but getting everybody where they're supposed to go, but then setting up the operations center and being able to report their commander, give them the best information we had at the time and, and recommendations as to what we should do. Okay. Um, so now also as, um, you know, a member of the military, did you, what was your reaction when they finally had captured Bin Laden and ultimately, you know, about course, time. Yeah. Right. About time. <laughs> um, yeah. did you, was there any like, um, did the military know that that was an operation or was that kind of kept under lock and key? Well, that, they're, that they caught him when they were going that after him. That they were going after him. But, well, they've been going after him for years. You right. Know, you know, so, so that specific operation, no, they weren't going to tell anybody about that. That mm -hmm. was that was like the one where they killed the, uh, uh, oh, when they, Oh, you're talking about when they killed Osama bin Laden. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, you know, I, I was thinking of Saddam Hussein. Oh, yes. Yeah. I remember that also. Yeah. When they killed... No, that wasn't... No one's going to know about that. It's yeah. a very simple fact. You know, you, you you just keep a close hold. The more people know about it, the more of a chance you're going to get that... That, that he's that not going to be yeah. captured and killed, yeah. ultimately. That someone's going to find out about it and mm -hmm. pass the word. Mm -hmm. No, no one knew about that except for the guys who were going to be doing it. Wow. And the people in, I guess, the White House. and Right. So they kept and, it quiet. Yeah. It wasn't like yeah. a big open military secret. No, 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 okay. no. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, do you think that um, the way the military operated for certain events um, changed after 9-11? Like, um, obviously, heightened security... Um, but do you think overall they, they took a more, um, like conscious role of what was going on around them? Yeah, because it became real. 
Yeah. And, and it's just like everything else, you know, when the initial thing happens, okay, mm -hmm. everybody's on high alert, and then it starts, starts drifting off. So when you had the thing in 93, mm -hmm. you know, so everyone was, okay, where are they, you know, and then all of a sudden it starts, it starts drifting off again. Mm -hmm. and, <coughs> and, and it's only natural. It's only natural. It, it, it's very difficult to keep the same high state of alert all the time. Right. So uh, with, after this thing here, uh, when they started deploying the troops, uh, it was a little bit different. It was a little bit different then because now you're actually taking action mm -hmm. against someone slash thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, it stayed... It stayed pretty, uh, the state of readiness was pretty high after that. For a while. Yeah. 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 Um, so, where am I going? Um, Fort Monmouth um, was, was heavy into the aftermath of 9-11 because it was so local, yeah. I assume. Um, so now, are you... Do you still talk to anybody else who was at Fort Monmouth that day, like um, that was still enlisted at the time? Oh yeah, we got. Uh, we have a bunch of us that uh, go out for lunch every couple of months. Okay. Yeah, you know, the we were all part of the uh, director of plans, training, and mobilization, mm -hmm. and uh, we we're all involved in the aftermath. You know, setting up the operation center. Okay. Yeah, I think. Uh, uh, Melissa's already spoken to one of them, or, or one of the people. That, that was John Acapinti. Yes. Yeah, John was, uh, he was with the military intelligence unit at the time, if I remember correctly. I don't think he was, he was actually, I'm trying to figure out. No, John, John might have been, John might have been in, in, in the director at that time, but he wasn't, uh, he wasn't the director. Okay. Then there's another guy by the name of Don Davison, there's uh, Charlie Slate, we got together, Walt Gordon, who was uh, the provost marshal at the time. Uh, well, one of the high, highest civilian in the provost marshal, he's since passed away, died of cancer a couple of years yeah. ago. But uh, we all used to get together to have lunch, you know, mm -hmm. and, and just, you know, just talk, just just four or five guys and, mm -hmm. and a couple of women just sit around and talk about what we did. Does that yeah. event ever come up? Uh, just this past year with the 20th, you know, 20th observance. Right. Yeah. 20th anniversary of the event. That was, that's yeah. it. But no, not really. Has anyone um, in that, you know, friend group um, kind of thought that something else, you know, would happen for 9-11? I know that a lot of people were concerned that an anniversary, something might happen, they might strike, you know. Yeah, that, that, that's because they like, they like to, uh, you know, the terrorists like to use a date, you know. As right. A, uh, no, 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 no one really thought that. Okay. The, the only thing they thought was just that the president wanted to make it a, you know, we're all out of, we're out of Afghanistan at this time. Right, right. The 20th anniversary. Right, but they didn't think um, any kind of event no. would follow that. No. Well, that's a good thing. Yeah. I know yeah. it was relieving that, you know, we got through that day in one piece. I personally get very anxious that day. Um, is there anything else you would like to add about 9-11 and your thoughts? Well, you know the Asbury Park Press was uh, was at the event, you know, because mm -hmm. they were they were gonna they were gonna write a story on it, and uh, they killed the story. Oh, they, they killed the story because because I thought it was uh, uh, too coincidental or suspicious, you know. And all of a sudden, you know, this happens the same day, the that same day that 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 the fort ran an exercise. On. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So they, they ended up they ended up killing the story on it. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. I I would think that they would you know want the that kind of publicity you know for. Yeah. Well, um, every everything after that, I mean, it did write about the fort, but nothing to do with the exercise. It was just the way the fort reacted, you know, to to what happened that day. So was the exercise that you conducted that day um, kept quiet for a while? If they if they killed that story, like to the public, did the public know? Uh. We publish it. In the, we publish it in the Mammoth Message. Okay. Yeah, you know, that we that we ran the exercise and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, everybody on the fort knew, or most people on the fort knew, an exercise was going off. Right. Yeah. So I mean, it wasn't. And I imagine when they went home, they talked. They talked to their families and other people about right. it. Right. So, 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 so I mean, it, it, it wasn't hidden. I mean, there was no no reason to to hide it. Okay. You know? So it wasn't like um, 
Like any kind of um, secret operation? No, no. Okay. No. So it was pretty known. Yes. Type deal. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, after the event. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you said uh, four. There were four operations going on that day, correct? Uh, at least three. Okay. At least three. I think the Air Force was running one. We we're running one. And uh, someone else was running one. All in New Jersey? No. No, okay. no, no. This is this throughout the United States. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So they, they all had... So it wasn't just, you know, it was just a random day. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, any time, I mean, the, the military the military runs exercises all the time. Mm -hmm. Just to increase their state of readiness, find out where the holes are in their plans. You know, right. You know, just... <clears throat> and just to practice, so, so they they do it year round. We we used to run maybe what four, five, six exercises a year. Okay. Yeah. And matter of fact, we ran Timely Alert uh, three in August of two thousand two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, it, so and we ran a couple of other you know tabletop exercises uh, in two thousand two also. So mm -hmm. I mean, it it was not a an unusual thing to be running exercises. Right. Yeah, the date was coincidental, you know, more than anything else. Yeah. But, but not the event itself. Mm. It's, it's something that, that that it worked out that way. It it really, it it's crazy. Yeah, the the joke, the joke was, you know, when people found out that we're running exercises, we we're going to be running another counterterrorism exercising. Guys were saying, "Could you let me know when it's going to be? Because I want to be on, I want to be on leave. I want to be on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be around here when you're they running don't an wanna, exercise." <laughs> oh God! Yeah, God forbid something yeah. like that. Gallows happens. humor. You know, oh my what goodness! It was. Yeah. Oh. Anything else you want to touch upon? Uh, I think that's it, Kelly. If you have any questions, right. any additional questions, just give me a call. You all got right. my number. I sure do. Thank you very much. I appreciate well, not at it. Not at all. Appreciate it very much. All right.